Good afternoon. Welcome to the Sustainability and Energy webinar series. Uh, we are in 2015. Uh, today we are having a presentation on making geothermal, that is ground source heat pumps, uh, more cost effective. Uh, we have a speaker, uh, Matthew Slager, which uh, we are waiting to get connected. And we also have with us a co-host, um, Hope Evans. She's from Louisville and she is our uh, is a co-chair of the ground source heat pump uh, RECX, that's Regional uh, Center of Expertise. And she's going to talk to us a little bit about that in a moment. But first, I want to cover the uh, process to get your CEUs or learning units if you're a member of AIA uh, and need these. We will um, be taking quizzes in groups of five uh, from the series. Um, download the quizzes from the uh, website shown on the screen and then send the answers to the, uh, the email address uh, down below um, with your answers and your AIA number and we will uh, see that you get credit um, for participating. Um, with that, I'm going to flip over to the presentation and I'm going to introduce <coughs> and turn it over to Hope Evans to talk a little bit about the RECX uh, before we proceed to the presentation. Hope? Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Hope Evans. I'm the co-chair of the Ground Source Heat Pump Regional Center of Excellence. Um, and we've done uh, several projects uh, throughout the Corps, uh, most recently uh, Fort Dick and um, Fort Campbell Administration Building. Um, we're a group of uh, 24 people who specialize in uh, ground source heat pumps throughout the Corps. Uh, we, we do everything from uh, design and construction to troubleshooting after the fact. Uh, there's uh, 24 people. Uh, many of them are registered professional engineers. There's scientists as well as geologists. And um, currently we're doing a uh, life cycle cost analysis and feasibility study of the Maple River Aqueduct up in uh, Minneapolis and Fargo. Today's, uh, today's speaker is, uh, is actually from an engineering firm. Uh, frequently we will call on experts within the industry to come and present to us and uh, just kind of let us know what they're doing out there to make ground source heat pumps more life cycle cost effective. Uh, our speaker today is actually the chief engineer at uh, Hanson Professional Design Services. His name is Matt Slager. He is a registered professional engineer in multiple states. He is also a certified geo exchange designer and a lead accredited professional as well. And he's going to be talking a little bit today about how to make uh, ground source heat pumps more life cycle cost effective. And with a lot of the new ECBs and UFCs coming out, um, you know, life cycle cost effectiveness is something that we could all use a little help with, uh, particularly in this climate of declining funding where we're really having to do a very delicate balance of energy efficiency versus life cycle cost effectiveness versus the programmed amount. All right. Um, today I want to talk about, um, you know, making geothermal more effective, more cost effective. And so the whole idea of this seminar is, um, you know, how do we, how do we build more cost effective geothermal systems? Um, and so you really want to make this sort of like an intermediate level geothermal seminar. I'm not, I'm not really going to get into the basics of geothermal and how geothermal works. I think uh, most, most or all of you have already heard that spiel. Um, what I really want to talk about today is how do we, how do we make these things more cost effective? What are the, the tricks that you can do to, um, to build these things more cost effectively and operate them more efficiently and have them last a long time? So today the, um, progress that we're going to make through this is, is how to design these things efficiently, how to right size them so that we don't oversize them, we try to keep the cost down by, by not making them too big, what kind of things can we do in the building to actually make the system smaller, what kind of other efficiency measures can we do to make the, the geothermal system less expensive, and we're going to talk about how to eliminate some of the unnecessary components to actually reduce the first cost. We're going to talk about how to design for low maintenance and, and how to design for um, you know, a long life system and how to really calculate that life cycle cost correctly um, so that we can justify putting in more of these systems. 
um, and actually get you know the right uh, life cycle costs. So, you know, why why geothermal heat pumps? Why is it important? You know, why are we talking about? Why is it so important to understand how to design these things cost effectively? You know, is is it really the right solution? And and so before I get into you know how how to do them cost effectively, I want to talk about why we're doing it. And there's there's a, a couple executive orders out there, and there's a, a law out there coming down from the federal government for all the federal agencies that that really are pushing ground source heat pumps as, as the primary technology to heat and cool buildings. And and I I made these slides a couple weeks ago, and and it just so happens that there was a new executive order issued on uh, on March 19th um, that that actually replaced a couple of these executive orders. Didn't really change the language. Didn't um, you know change the goals. So so I didn't update the slides, but. The point is that <clears throat> there's this executive order out there that says by 2020 all federal buildings have to be designed to achieve net zero by the year 2030. So what does that mean to us? You know, how, starting in the year 2020, how do you design a building to achieve net zero without a heat pump? You really can't. I mean, ultimately, you can't be burning fossil fuels in a building, you know, and producing those renewably. It's just really not practical. So from a practical standpoint, by the year 2020, all buildings that start getting designed really have to be incorporating some sort of heat pump system. And, and ground source heat pumps are the most obvious one, particularly for northern climates. Um, and there's also another, you know, and, and that's an executive order. Yeah, those things can be changed. They, and, and you saw, you know, a couple weeks ago they were changed. They were overridden again. But there's also a law out there, the Energy Independence and Security Act of 2007, that requires that 100% that elimination of fossil fuel in all new buildings and major renovations by 2030. So you've got the same thing codified in a in a law, and, that, and that's not likely to change anytime soon. And so, so we really have to figure out how to do these things cost effectively because it is the future. It is going to be in you know nearly every building, if not every building, soon. You know, and then on top of that, you've got um, other executive orders that require renewable energy, and um, these executive orders have also included renewable energy from a geothermal heat pump is considered a renewable energy source. The thermal energy generated from these things is considered a source of renewable energy and can count towards the goals, uh, the National Defense Authorization Act goal of the 25 percent from renewable energy by 2025. And, and so not only does it, you know, reduce building energy use, but it can actually be counted as meeting your renewable goals. And so it's kind of a double whammy. And in fact, if you think about it, you know, the lower you actually get your energy, it actually reduces the amount of uh, renewable you have to, you know, install because it's all a percentage-based scheme. So, so ground source heat pumps are one of the most powerful tools can be used to meet all these uh, renewable and energy efficiency goals. And, and so how do we build cost-effective ground source heat pump systems to meet these goals. And, and there's really <clears throat> there's really four main things I want to talk about today is <clears throat> building an efficient system, you know, building one that has low installation costs, building one that has low maintenance characteristics that isn't going to be a real headache for the maintenance guys, and then one that's going to last for a long time, you know, and then properly calculate that, that life cycle cost for all those things. And if any one of these pieces are missing, you really don't get a, a cost-effective system. You can't just have something that's really efficient if it costs a lot of money to build, or if it doesn't last a long time or it's hard to maintain, because you, you just won't get the performance that you expected and the, and the economics don't shake out. So you really have to focus on all of these factors to really reach the pinnacle of efficiency that you're looking for. So what makes geothermal efficient? Not all geothermal systems are the same thing. and They're not all efficient. Just because you take um, you take a, a ground heat exchanger and you attach it to a, an HVAC system, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be efficient. So when you break it down to the fundamentals, ground source heat pumps are efficient because you can take a little bit of electrical energy and you can turn it into a lot of thermal energy, right? So typically we're, with the heat pump, we're taking like one unit of electricity and it's got a COP of, you know, three to five, um, de you know, depending on the water temperature. So we're typically getting, you know, three or four units of free energy out of the earth to heat the building. You know, and on the cooling side, it's, it's more efficient because the ground's obviously on uh, more uh, moderate temperature than outside. So, so what really makes it efficient? It's not just 
the high COP, you know, the fact that you've got a moderate temperature source, you also really have to think about low fan power and low pump power. And, and a lot of folks don't really consider that when they think geothermal. They think, oh, I'm just going to slap a ground source heat exchanger on a VAV with reheat, and I'm going to have an efficient system. Well, yeah, it's going to be better, but, but it could be much better if you focus on fan power and pump power. And I'm going to go through a few examples with that. So the first thing I want to talk about is compressor lift. And compressor lift is basically um, the pressure difference that a compressor has to operate at. And, and you can think about that as like, you know, the temperature difference that that compressor has to work against. So for a traditional like air-cooled chiller, I like to use this example because it shows that an air-cooled chiller really has to you know, work between like 35 degree refrigerant temperature and 105 to really cool your building. And the reason that, and that's made up of several components, the reason is you've got, you've got that, you know, you're trying to make 55 degree air with your air handling unit, you know, and it's 95 degrees outside. You have, you have this approach temperature on the cooling coil you see in green, but you also have the approach on the, on the actual piece of equipment, on the evaporator and the condenser, and those are in red and orange here. Um, so all those things sort of add up to what, what is the temperature lift that compressor has to do. And that lift is roughly proportional to how hard that compressor has to work and how much energy it's going to use. And so anything you can do to reduce that lift makes it more efficient. You know, one of the examples I used to use, um, the last company I worked for was the energy modeling specialist for that company. And I used to get calls all the time from engineers and they would say, I did my lead energy model and I we're putting an air-cooled chiller in, and the baseline is an air source DX, and it's showing I'm using more cooling energy. Why is that? I said, because it's less efficient. Well, I paid more money for the chiller. It should be more efficient. Yeah, but you can't get past basic physics. You have this approach temperature in there on the coil, and that requires a higher lift. And a higher lift means harder work on the compressor. And so the same principle applies when we go to geothermal. You look at, like, air source VRF, Air source VRF and air source DRX, you know, they're both more efficient than, than something like an air-cooled chiller that doesn't have those approach. But they're very similar on design day, right? They both have to deal with physics and they overcome in the, the, the temperature lift um, to cool your building. And you look at something like a single sport, single speed ground source heat pump system in the, in the cooling mode, you know, its advantage is that you have a much more moderate temperature. You know, on the design day, depending on what we design that ground loop for, you know, in this case it might be like 85 degrees. You, you have all those same, you know, lifts, you know, similar approach temperatures on the condenser and evaporator, but you're dealing with a much more moderate temperature, so your compressor doesn't work as hard. And that, this is where people think of efficiency, you know, and we look at, we do a lot of geothermal VRF um, because VRF is becoming popular and actually, you know, the water source VRF is, in my opinion, is a much, much better option, particularly for um, folks in the northern half of the country. So you're going to see a lot of examples of uh, geothermal VRF in this presentation. Um, but geothermal VRF operates very similar to um, to single speed, you know, ground source heat pumps on a design day. Um, and then another ex example that um, is becoming popular is um, geothermal chill beams, right? And the whole idea of the chill beam is that you can use a pretty moderate temperature chilled water, much warmer chilled water, and actually still cool your building. You're, at that point, you're only doing sensible cooling with that chilled beam, but at least that portion of it can be a very, very low lift. So you can, if you take advantage of what it offers, you can um, get some very, very efficient systems. And so I would encourage people to try to stay to the system to the right. You know, you can certainly apply geothermal to some of these other, you know, packaged rooftop units or, or water source, uh, you know, water to water heat pumps and, and sort of really, you know, traditional VAV with reheat systems. But you're, you're going right back to some of the higher lifts and, and Get, you're destroying some of the opportunities that you have to have a very efficient system. Um, and you look at part day conditions, uh, part load conditions, and, and some of these systems have a, the advantage of, you know, uh, like a variable speed compressor and an air source VRF. Really the advantage there is that it reduces that lift. Um, you'll see the dashed lines there is, is reducing the lift, the, the temperature approach across that if evaporator and condenser is reduced. And you get the same thing with like a, a two-stage compressor, it, uh, as long as they're sharing a circuit. So you can get, you know, better part load efficiency if you have some sort of a two-stage compressor or a variable speed compressor. And that's the whole idea is just to reduce the lift. 
you know, so again, encourage you to try to use some of the unitary equipment, you know, unitary ground source heat pumps, the, the variable uh, variable refrigerant flow type geothermal systems or chilled beam, geothermal chilled beams, those are going to be some of the more efficient ways to apply geothermal. But it's not just about compressor lift, as I mentioned previously, it's about fan power. You know, one of the things people don't realize about geothermal systems is a lot of the energy savings actually comes from reduced fan power. You know, here's a chart that I pulled from another presentation, and it has a standard unitary, you know, this is a two-ton ground source heat pump, you know, it's compared to like the code allowed fan power. And if you've designed VAV systems before, you know that it's very, very difficult to design a VAV system for a large building and stay within the code limits for fan power. Heat pumps, geothermal heat pumps, the unitary type, right out of the box, they're much, much lower fan power than what we traditionally design systems for. And, and if you go to something like a geothermal VRF, like a ductless type system, they can be even more more efficient because of the lower fan power and the, the lack of static pressure. So, you know, that's something to, some food for thought there is, you know, let's design these systems to not have a ton of fan power and, um, and be more efficient. And that's one of the big, big benefits of geothermal is being able to reduce fan power. And then the other factor is pump power. You know, you, if you put a, a geothermal system in and you put a huge pump on it, it's just a big resistance heater you're sticking in the, in the geothermal loop side of it. And you can really kill your efficiency if you don't do a good job with the pump power. And ASHRAE actually has some metrics for geothermal system pump power. And it's like a good, better, best. They have like an A, B, C, D rating. That's what this chart is trying to show. And so they, they categorize it if you stay, you know, within, you know, 50 watts per ton is considered an A rating. 100 watt, you know, like 80 watts per ton is considered a B rating. It's good, and, and so on and so forth. And so this this is sort of good guidance to try to stick with. We really like to try to be in the A B range to have an efficient system. And, and believe me, it's actually fairly challenging with some of these systems to get down that low on pump power. You know, and I've seen numerous systems that have C range, D range pump power, even double the D range. You know, twice twice that amount of pump power. You know, and th those aren't going to be efficient systems. They're going to use all that savings. They're going to burn it up and pump, pump these things. And just to kind of um, give you a point of comparison here, you know, we, we do a number of geothermal VRF systems, and the advantage there is that you've got centralized compressors in the mechanical room, so you don't have to pump water around the building. So those can, those can be very, very low pump power systems. But you know, we've done half a dozen now, and they're all A-rated, A you know, many of them half of... Uh, half of the typical pump power of an A rating. So you can design very, very low pump power systems if you really put some effort into it and make it very efficient. And just to kind of as a point of reference, um, we show here the range of, of a typical um, air source condenser and how much, um, how many watts of fan there is per ton of equipment. Um, and so you can see, like, that's one of the big advantages of, like, a water source unit versus an air source unit is it just takes a lot less energy to move water than it does to move air through a condenser. And so that's the other big advantage that geothermal provides is the waste less energy moving heat around. And this is just another good example. Um, this is some dash data from the ASHRAE journal. And there's a series of seven articles that were written by Steve Cavanaugh and published in the ASHRAE journal. And this is, this is a chart out of one of them that we pulled data from. And it's survey data from actual installed geothermal systems. And you can see um, they, they plotted like energy star ratings versus how many pump powers, horsepower per ton, um, are installed. And you'll see there's some correlation there between how much pump power is there, you know, horsepower per ton, and how good the energy star rating in the building is. Um, it's entirely possible to design a geothermal system that's really, really low energy star rating. You just put a huge pump on it, or you put really bad controls on it. And there are actually a fair number of them out there. And you probably hear a lot of those horror stories. Those are the people that talk about it, are the ones that didn't go well. One of the keys to avoiding being that, that building that didn't have a good result is to keep your pump power down. You'll notice that all the ones that were in the A and B rating have a pretty good energy star rating. And so that's one of the keys that I, I want to try to drive home is we really got to focus on fan and pump power and, and be conscious of that when we design efficient systems. And the next thing we want to talk about is how do we, how do we um, 
size these systems and reduce the first cost. Um, right sizing these systems is the first step to doing cost effective geothermal systems. And when I say right sizing, it's so much more important for geothermal to right size it than it is on their HVC systems. And the reason for that is because we pay so much for that energy source. You know, when, when you ask the gas company to bring a line to your building, you know, they're supplying all the energy, they're designing all that. They, they actually, you know, it's a very expensive to build a pipeline, but they finance that and charge you money over time. Um, so that money is spread out over time, but when we put a geothermal system in, it's a big capital cost that we pay up front to install that ground loop, unless you're going to do some sort of loop lease program. Um, so it, it's much more important to right size the geothermal system than it is to right size a furnace, for example. I mean, take a residential example. Um, you can get a furnace that's 50% oversized, and you, know, you might pay 10% more for that furnace. Now, if you do the same thing with a, a geothermal system, 50% oversized, it might actually probably going to cost you about 50% more. You know, it's pretty linear in terms of, you know, the cost. So, so right-sizing these things is so important because it really can really, really hurt your paybacks if you're oversized. And so that's the first thing is make sure we get these things sized reasonably, use reasonable safety factors. You know, one of the things we do, um, you know, we have to have safety factors to make sure that when things go wrong in construction that you still be able to heat and cool the building. One of the things we do differently is, like, when we size the, the load for the room, we put a certain safety factor on that. When we size it for the block load, we put a smaller safety factor on, right? Because you may have some rooms that, that you know, needed a bigger safety factor because something went wrong there, but they're not all going to have that same problem. So we don't put as big a factor on the block load as we do the, the room level. And that's, that's some of the things we can do to help right size these things. And an accurate ener energy model is huge. It's huge for these things. It's the most important thing we do. And, and one of the other unique things that we do to right size our systems is we bought these window meters, right? I got tired of walking into existing buildings trying to do an HVC renovation and the owner never, ever, ever knows what type of windows they have. There's never a record of it. And so unless there's a label on the bottom corner of the window and you can look it up and find the properties of that window, you're just guessing at what's there. And the windows have such a large role to play in terms of size on the ground heat exchanger. So we bought these window meters and they allow us to go out and measure pane thickness, the number of panes, the, the gap between the panes, whether there's a low E coating in that window or not, where it's at, on which surface it's on. Uh, it also tell you if there's a lamination, like if, if you've got blast proof windows, which is probably pretty common for your projects, um, and where that lamination is. Um, and then we've got this other window meter that we, um, for operable windows, you can open the window and stick it on there and it, it reads what the solar heat gain coefficient is. So then we can dial in and figure out what exactly the window is. And so for these renovation projects now, you know, we can spend a little bit of time, a little more engineering time, get a little bit extra fee up front, and save 10, 20, 50 times that amount of money in construction costs by reducing the size of the ground heat exchanger and the size of the equipment by right sizing it. One of the other things um, that you probably have heard a lot about is conductivity testing, right? It's another way to right size a system, right? We have books we can go and look up based on, you know, water well logs nearby. You might, you can figure out what the geology is, and you can go and look it up in a book and say, well, and if I know it's shale, it's in this range of thermal conductivity. The problem is you've got to design to something fairly conservative so that you know that it works. You know, knowing that it's probably going to perform better, but you've got to design to that worst case unless you really know what the thermal conductivity is. So for larger projects, it pays to know what that is. And these conductivity tests aren't that expensive. Um, what they do is they go and install one bore. One, so you've got to have some preliminary design and know where you want that bore because you really want to use it in your final ground heat exchanger. So you want that bore to the right depth, the depth you're going to use, and you want it in the right location to where you use it in your bore field. So you have to do some preliminary design to actually locate this thing. But once you do, they go out there and they drill one of these wells, and they hook a heater up to it, and they run it for three days, and, and they can measure ground thermal conductivity. So the cost of doing this you know, tends to be three to $5,000 on top of what it would cost to drill one of your wells. So basically, you're buying one of your wells, and you're paying another three to $5,000 to test it. Um, that's not cost effective on small projects. In small projects, we just you know, pick the conservative conductivity out of the book. You get an extra well or two 
and that's probably less expensive than doing the connectivity test. And you got a better performing heat exchanger out of it as a result. So, you know, it's one of those things on large projects, you know, you pass you know, 20 tons or something of that size, and, and you probably want to be doing one of these unless you're really confident on what the connectivity is in the area. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is, you know, how buildings influence the ground loop size. So, so how can we adjust what we're doing in the building? How does that affect the ground loop size? And this is one of the most important things I want people to take away from this presentation is that what we do in the building can be changed. You know, we can we can sort of play the building like a piano and adjust things and change window types and all those sort of things to affect the ground loop size. So what are those parameters that affect that ground loop size? It's not just peak load. It's not just how many tons of cooling we've connected to it. The other factors that really affect that ground loop size are you know, how much seasonally, how much heating and cooling are we putting in the ground? How much are we taking out of the ground winter and summer? You know, what's the balance of those heating versus cooling energy? You know, are we primarily taking heat out of the ground and cooling? We're primarily putting heat into the ground and heating. And then and then on top of that, you've got to factor in how much fan, pump, and compressor energy you're sticking in the ground. Because really all of the heat from those fans and the compressors and the pumps, they all go to just heating that loop up, whether it's summer or winter, they're adding heat to that loop or adding heat to your building. So you factor those those things in, and those are the, really the things that we can affect to lower the size of the ground heat exchanger. And this is just one example that I'm showing here of a ground heat exchanger modeled over a 20-year period. So you can kind of see what the water temperature does throughout the year, right? It's not a static number. It doesn't stay at you know 55 degrees or whatever your deep earth temperature is. It varies as we load the ground. And it varies as we load energy into that ground through the season. And typically, it's a sine curve. Of course, this one is a school. So you can see there's a bit of a hitch in the summer there where they go unoccupied during the summer. But typically, it follows a sine curve, right? To some peak on the cooling and some peak you know, minimum on the heating. And so we can adjust. You know, if, if the building loads, the peak loads are changed. It obviously affects how high those peak. But also, seasonally, if we stick less energy in the ground, if we pick for example, more efficient ways of operating our building, we put less heat in the ground, it affects how high those peaks get. So it's not just the peak numbers that matter, it's also how much energy we put in out of the ground seasonally. And then also the trend is this, you know, I purposely made this one look like it's cooling dominant, and you see the trend was upwards, right? And most, frankly, most commercial buildings we do are cooling dominant. You know, I don't care if you're in the northern part of the U.S., it's probably a cooling dominant building. Most of them are just by nature, because once you get over a certain size, they just are cooling dominant. And so there's a lot of things we can do if we can help balance the loads, balance it between heat and cooling. You don't see that upward trend, and then we don't have to put as much heat exchanger in. Because if you'll notice on year one, we're only getting to like 80 degrees on the cooling side. Whereas on year 20, you know, we're up 90, in the 90, you know, ni almost 90 degrees. And so if we balance that, we can start out with you know, designing to 85 or something of that nature and, you know, maintain that and you don't need as much ground loop then. So if we think about that and we understand it and we iterate with, you know, window selection and all these other things, we can affect the ground heat exchanger size. And so I just want to give you some general examples of what we can do in the building to change and reduce that ground heat exchanger size because there's a lot of things. Lighting efficiency measures. Um, so when you talk about are we going to do LED lighting in this building, it's something that really ought to be considered in conjunction with geothermal because not only does it lower the peak cooling, but it lowers the total energy use. And those things can factor into the geothermal. So it may, you know, your lighting upgrade may or may not make sense by itself, but if you're also looking at geothermal, maybe the two of them together have some synergy and you can justify the com combination of the two. High efficiency heat pumps, that's a big one. Um, a lot of times it's actually more efficient to buy more, it's less expensive to buy a high efficiency heat pump because it puts less compressor heat in the ground. So if you got a cooling dominant building, that's a big deal. We buy a more efficient heat pump, we put less compressor energy in the ground in the summer, and we take you know, less um, compressor heat to heat the air in the winter, so we're extracting more from the ground. It helps balance that load on an annual basis, can actually reduce the size of our ground heat exchanger and pay for itself. 
Um, so that's something you really have to con consider strongly when you look at what heat pumps you're going to use, what systems we're going to use. Um, lower fan and pump power, we kind of hit on that, but those things all go into adding energy to that loop. And if you're cooling dominant, anything you can do to reduce the fan and pump power actually helps reduce the cost on the project. Uh, window films and coatings, that's huge. And you know, I talked about those energy window meters for right sizing. Well, if you find out you've got a window that doesn't have a coating, there's the things you can do to retrofit windows. You know, or if it's a new building, you know, you can influence what type of window they're picking. You know, is it shaded or you know, is it tinted or not? Is it have a low E coating or not? You know, what what type of coating does it have? And there's a lot of things you can do um, to adjust those uh, the loads in the building to affect the ground heat exchanger size the way you want it. Domestic water heating is another good example for cooling down in the buildings. We can extract a lot of heat from that loop just by adding domestic water heating. So you might actually be able to lower the total system cost by adding domestic hot water to the geothermal system. Snow melt is another good example. You have a really cooling down at building. Adding snow melt might actually reduce the heat exchanger size if it's cooling down. With. Pool heating, another good example. Great way to take heat out of your loop on an annual basis. You can connect multiple buildings together. So let's say we do have a heating down in a building that's adjacent to a cooling down in a building. If we, if we give them both their own geothermal loops, those are larger than the sum of the two would have to be if they were combined. So doing things like district systems can actually, you know, improve paybacks on these. Um, you, we see that in um, a, there's at least three colleges that I'm aware of that have installed geothermal systems on their entire campus. The whole idea is that you you put a loop around the campus and you serve multiple buildings. You get that diversity on the central plant and the diversity on the well field. And it puts um, a lot more average load on that well field, and, and the capital cost can come way down as a result. And efficiency can actually go up because you get simultaneous heating and cooling that you can take advantage of. Um, and there's no reason we can't apply that to military projects, and military bases, and do an entire campus system. It's just going to take a little bit of courage and and some planning to to implement that. And the other thing I really want to point out here is that even energy efficiency measures that only affect part load energy use can actually affect the cost of the ground heat exchanger. And that's unlike other systems, right? So if somebody puts in an occupancy sensor that shuts off lighting, that typically isn't going to affect the cooling equipment size for the space, because the engineer is going to size it for the worst case load in there. But for ground heat exchanger, it does affect the part load energy use. And that affects the ground heat exchanger size. So some of these energy efficiency measures, if you bundle them with geothermal, can actually make the system more cost effective. And so you want to consider those things together when you when you do your energy modeling. Um, and there's a lot of opportunities with the, with the ventilation in your building to do energy recovery. You know, one of the things to think about is adding energy recovery may actually be a negative first cost with a geothermal system because it actually costs less to buy that energy recovery device than it does to install the equivalent ground heat exchanger you'd need. So a lot of times you can both reduce first cost and improve energy by adding energy recovery at your, um, on your ventilation. And then design for cold supply. You know, um, this is a big one. We downsize our, you know, typically we have dedicated outside air systems that serve these rooms with heat pumps. And if we supply the air cold, we can often downsize the heat pumps that serve those rooms that are recirc only. Um, now we can put resets on those so that you can have neutral you know, when you need it or even warm air if you need to supplement heat with it. But why waste that cooling? And that's one of the keys that you should take away here is there's a lot of things we can do with discharge temp optimization um, to optimize uh, the, the energy use in the building, um, demand control ventilation, and simple, simple resets based on schedules um, can be done. And, and one of the other things to think about is, does it have to be 100% geothermal? We've done a number of projects where we do air-cooled, dedicated outside air units. Why? Well, it's the school, and it only runs 8 to 3.30 for nine months a year. You know, that's 18% of the year if you really do the math. So there's just not that many run hours on some of the ventilation units for some certain types of buildings. And so it may not make sense to put that on your geothermal loop. It doesn't have to be an all-or-nothing thing. And so the low-hanging fruit is really conditioning the space. And that's just another thing to think about is 
you know, can you hybridize these systems and get heat rejection out of some sort of air cool device and lower your first cost and, um, you know, pick that low hanging fruit if you can't justify an entire project. Um, so this is an example of um, a geothermal VRF system we put in that kind of takes that philosophy of the air cooled rooftop unit that you see in the middle there. And it was a, this is an addition. This is one of the wings they added on with four classrooms. You see the ceiling cassette in the center of the classroom there in blue. That, that was doing the space conditioning. And so this is sort of like a hybrid geothermal VRF where you've got an air source heat pump, DOAS, dedicated outside air unit, that, that does the conditioning of the outside air. It doesn't run that many hours. And you've got geothermal VRF doing the space conditioning, it's just recirculation only. And we, when you run an energy model, the interesting thing you find is that, and this was another example project, the, the dedicated asset air unit on, on that project was 40% of the installed tons. Okay? So the VRF was the other 60%. But in the energy model, the DOAS only represented 27% of the energy use, even though it was an air source heat pump, versus you know, the geothermal VRF was 73% of the energy use. And that's because of the disparity in run hours, right? The VRF, VRF has to condition the building 24-7 whereas the ventilation is only on, in this case, 18% of the year. The other way to reduce the cost of the heat exchanger or, or the geothermal system it is with energy storage. And, and this can be something very, very simple, like domestic hot water. Um, you may not think about it, but um, a lot of times our water heaters are storage devices, right? They, you know, even your home water heater is a storage tank with a small element in it. And you can get instantaneous water heaters, but um, the storage type are typically more economical because we're going to put a small amount of energy in over a long period of time and have some energy stored there. You don't have to buy, buy as big of an element. Well, the heat pump, it sort of exacerbates that, right? You don't want to buy a bunch of expensive heat pumps and buy a big geothermal loop just to hook up domestic hot water to it. So if you're finding that you're um, heating dominant, you're constrained by the size of your heating on your geothermal loop. This is a simple thing that you can do to reduce the amount of heat that's being extracted in the winter, you know, reduce the peak essentially, you spread that out over time, right? So if you find that you're going to need, an example would be like six water source heat pumps serving one storage tank, well maybe you cut that down to like two water source heat pumps and you put in three of those storage tanks and spread it out, allow that load to be spread out over a larger number of hours. Um, you can achieve the same amount of hot water storage and the same result by having a higher amount of storage. So when you think about geothermal, you ought to be thinking, I ought to have more storage and less heat pump when it comes to things like domestic hot water. And you can use it with ice storage. Uh, that might be a good combination with chilled beams. Um, that, that allows you to you know, shift some of that peak cooling load to off-peak hours. And so you have a smaller peak cooling load on your heat exchanger, your ground heat exchanger. You could also do things like um, hot water storage that would help, or, or even radiant floors. I mean, obviously there's a lot of thermal mass in a radiant floor, and if you can spread that load out over time, it can help reduce the, the required size of your ground heat exchanger. Um, and then hybrid systems. If you've done everything you can to reduce the building loads and balance the building loads and, and reduce peak loads, and you're still in a cooling dominant or heating dominant situation, making it hybrid is a good option and a good way to reduce the amount of bores that you've got to drill or the, or I should say, the, the size of the ground heating chamber you're installing. And so, you know, on, on, heating do on cooling dominant buildings, you can install all kinds of heat rejection devices, fluid coolers, cooling towers, dry coolers even in some cases, or hybrid fluid coolers. And we, we've the picture you see here was a, a project we did at... Uh, Camp Lincoln, uh, the National Guard, Illinois National Guard headquarters building there. Uh, it's a dry cooler on a, on a geothermal loop, and they use it to um, help balance that annual load because they were so cooling dominant on the annual basis. Um, in heating dominant buildings, you see boilers installed sometimes, but we just don't see that many heating dominant projects. I mean, really, if you get into a heating dominant project, um, it's, it's pretty unusual, and you know, typically just by allowing a little bit lower. Uh, design water temperature, you can get around really having to size your ground heat exchanger on the, on the heating load. But there is those options too, and, and you could do both. Um, and you know, with these hybrid systems, you get a large reduction in peak load, so you might cover like 30 to 50 percent of the cooling load, for example, with your 
with your supplemental device, but it really only has a small effect or even a negative effect on your energy use. You know, it could, you could actually reduce the energy use of your geothermal system by helping balance that loop out and, and make it more efficient. Um, and then there's simple things you can do with your piping schemes to reduce cost too. Um, you know, this is the, what we're showing here is a more traditional type of two-pipe system, right? So we, we've got a pump and a VFD and it's just like everybody thinks about, we pump water out and we control it based on pressure. And then we've got a valve on each heat pump and those valves open and close and let water flow through the heat pump when it's on and shut it off when it's off. You know, this is what 90.1, the energy code, calls for for a pumping scheme. And it works if it's tuned properly and set up properly by the controls contractor. It can work. But some of the worst energy performing buildings actually have these type of systems because the VFDs don't, you know, they get overridden and run at constant volume. The pressure settings are too high or something goes wrong with the control loop. You know, there's, there's a lot of things that can go wrong with something like this. And so some of the other schemes that actually can be done cheaper are like a one pipe loop. And this may not make sense in every building, but um, there are concepts where you can pump pump the entire loop, and then it's basically you got a side stream circulator that pulls water off that loop, runs it through the heat pump. Um, so you can get some really simplified schemes here, and you don't have all the complex controls of the VFD and the shutoff valves, and you've got you've got really a simpler control mechanism. So and so there's things you can do with pumping schemes to reduce cost. Um, one of the other popular options that I like are like subcentral or decoupled systems. Um, the subcentral system is what you'd think of almost like like if, if somebody was to put in a, a residential geothermal system and they had like you know, multiple heat pumps in their house, let's say you've got two heat pumps, that contractor is not going to install a central pumping system and, for, and then put control valves on each heat pump. So they're going to put a pump on each heat pump and they're just going to pump in parallel, right? And when the heat pump's on, the pump's on. When the heat pump's off, the pump's off. And, and so that's a very simple, simple control scheme, which you see on the left there is, and it's, and it's very low cost too. And what you'll find is that you can actually reduce some of the, like the strainers. You only need one strainer, right? Because the pump needs a strainer and the heat pump needs a strainer. But when they're together, you can just have one. Um, so you can reduce some of the pressure drop there. It's a very simple system. It's very hard for people to screw up. It's hard for the controls to go wrong. So I really like that type of system. The challenge becomes if they're not all near each other and there's big um, pressure drops in the piping inside the building, that system may not work for you. But we, we t tend to use that a lot on like VRF systems where all the condensing units are in the same room. Um, and then there's decoupled too, right? So if, if your little pump can't overcome the head of your well field, it may make sense to decouple it and actually have a separate pump um, pump the well field. But it's very similar to the one on the left. Lower cost heat sinks. So most commercial geothermal systems are vertical bores. Bore hole in the ground, four to five inches, stick a, a pair of pipes in there with the U-bend on the bottom, grout it, and that's our heat exchanger. Most of them are that way, not because it's the cheapest method, but because it's the only method or the only one that engineer knew about, or the only one that he could get a driller to do, actually do and install. Um, so there's a lot of challenges there, but you know, some of the things you really ought to be thinking about are the opportunities is late coupled systems tend to be much cheaper than vertical systems. Really all of these are cheaper ways to do it. Late coupled, you know, if you've got a pond that's at least 12 feet deep or a lake that's at least 12 feet deep, uh, deeper is better uh, from a heating standpoint. It's a very cheap way to put a, a geothermal system is to sink uh, heat exchangers in the bottom of that. You can also do open loop. We, um, that one I showed you at Camp Lincoln with the dry cooler was uh, what we looked at using mine water. The whole idea is that the mine was flooded, the coal mine was flooded with water. We were going to pump water out from one spot, take heater out, in or out, and put it back in another spot. They didn't have enough water in that mine, but there are other areas in the country, particularly in the northeast, that have a lot of coal mines that are flooded with water. And there's a great opportunity there to do very, very low cost um, heat sinks for geothermal. Um, also, water leaving treatment plants, um, wastewater treatment, or whatever type of water treatment. The, there can be um, huge opportunities there to take the, the clear waste coming out of the back end of the plant and just change the temperature of the water and extract the heat or put heat into it. Uh, it's really a free energy source that, that can be tapped into if you have that. Dewatering pumps, I've seen dewatering pumps that, um, you know, they're trying to keep the groundwater out of a building or keep the groundwater away from a roadway. Um, and, you know, these things can be huge. I mean, there can be applications where there are thousands of GPM just being pumped into a river constantly, 24-7, all day long. 
and that's a, really a free energy source to be tapped into if you if it's available. Um, pump and dump, you see a open loop kind of stuff. We don't we don't see a lot of those type of projects, but they're certainly out there. Standing column gets done a lot in the Northeast where you've got a, a, the right geology for it. Um, we, we don't see that in the Midwest just because of the type of geology we have. Um, and horizontal systems, these don't get used probably as often as they should be, but you can trench in or open pit horizontal systems if you have the land to do it. They're almost always going to be cheaper than a vertical system. It's just a question of do you have the space. And if you do this, some of those things to right size your system and make your system smaller, sometimes you can actually make it fit a site by doing some efficiency things on the inside of your building. Directional boring is something that's become very, very popular. And you take these rigs that they put fiber optic lines in with and you can directionally bore and pop up several hundred feet away, uh, have no disturbance in between. And um, if you have a driller in your area that has these things um, and, and the right um, type of geology, in other words, you know, around here we have clay that goes down 30 to 45 feet. And so that's ideal, you know, to be, to be um, drilling through with one of these directional boring rigs. Um, they'll, they'll put one in at, you know, 10 or 15 foot deep and they can put another layer in at, you know, 30 feet and another one at 45 feet. And you can put multiple layers in and from one trench. And so you can save a lot of trenching costs, a lot of header costs. And you can get a much cheaper system with some of these directly bored systems um, if you've got the space again to do a horizontal type system. Also, site grading. Uh, this is something Matt, that we folks need to don't think. Pick up the uh, pace if you can. Sure. Uh, we're gonna. We've got about five minutes left. All right. Site grading. You know, if you if you're moving a lot of dirt on a site on new construction, think about you know can you lay the pipe on the ground and actually just push the dirt over on top of it. You know, if you're trying to level a site. There's oftentimes a lot of opportunity if somebody's building a berm or moving dirt to actually just lay the pipe on the ground and push it on top. So it's something to think about. And then where do you, how do you optimize the bore field layout too? Um, you know, how, the further apart the bores are, the better, right? But it's just a, it's just a matter of there's a cost trade-off between trenching and, and moving them apart. So if you put these things in a line or spread them out that way with a single trench like we have shown, you can reduce the, the cost uh, just by simply changing the shape of your bore field. Um, Getting, and then there's a lot of ways to actually reduce first cost on these systems by eliminating components that aren't needed. Vaults are a great example. You see a lot of vaults installed in geothermal systems. In most cases, they're not necessary. There's other ways to do it. So I say get rid of the vaults if you can. Put the headers inside. You can put, you can run all your, you know, two or three inch manifolds inside and header them inside. And it gets rid of that, you know, twenty to forty thousand dollar vault. In some cases, they're a hundred thousand dollar vault. They're very expensive pieces of equipment to put in the ground, and then you have you don't have to deal with all those issues that go along with vaults, you know. And don't use balancing valves on these things. You ought to be able to design them to not need balancing valves. You know, as long as they're balanced within fifth, plus or minus fifteen percent, it doesn't really make a difference in terms of how they perform. Um, and one of the other things we like to do is use um, if we get in a situation where we can't header inside, we use these um, shutoff valves that are um, curb stops, just like you'd see in domestic water, right? So you stick the rod down in the hole and you turn it and shut it off. There's no reason you can't bury those out in the yard with a sleeve that goes up to the surface. And we also do, um, we put the purge ports outside as well. You, know, you just bury them in a little quasi-concrete box. Um, so there's very cheap ways to avoid using uh, these expensive vaults. Uh, and lower cost headers is the other thing is instead of trenching in and disturbing a bunch of um, landscaping and roads and sidewalks and things, we often directionally bore the headers into the building. And you see here is an example from a school where we directionally bored into that uh, well field. Um, and so you get disturbance on each end and nothing in between. And that can help lower the cost of restoration. Um, interior piping, there's a lot of choices on interior piping. Um, traditionally use copper and steel, but um, steel, you know, has corrosion issues. Um, would encourage you to use copper. There's other options out there. You can use HTP. And the more popular ones are now are PEX for like terminations at heat pumps. You know, you can get up to an inch and a half or two inches on um, size. But what you see in the picture here is actually like a, a PPR type pipe. It's a it's a fiberglass reinforced polypropylene. So it has similar expansion characteristics to uh, copper and steel. But you don't have the corrosion issues. And typically you don't necessarily need insulation because if, if you're in a conditioned space, um, there's enough resistance there in the wall of that uh, piping that you um, won't sweat. So sometimes you can actually lower the cost by going to some of these higher end materials that uh, can eliminate your corrosion problems. And then design for flush carts. Um, 
these systems need to be flushed at two feet per second. And um, instead of bringing in a semi to flush these things, if you put a couple of purge ports inside, you can get a residential flush cart and flush them out. So you know, think about that. Is there a way to, to flush them cheaper uh, with a simpler cart? Um, limit condensate pipe insulation. Um, I see a lot of systems go in with insulation on all the condensate pipe. If it's PVC, it's not going to sweat unless it's full of water, right? So if it's sloped, it shouldn't sweat, except maybe right next to the unit where you have a trap, insulate that portion. Um, if, you, if you're entering water temperature, you know, if you're cooling dominant and you're in the south and you're entering water temperature is going to stay above 45 degrees for your modeling, you probably don't need antifreeze. So eliminate the antifreeze. That, that can actually improve the performance and make it cheaper. Um, and then eliminate controls where you can. You know, keep it simple. A, a lot of buildings get DDC controls that don't need it. If you don't need it, don't use them. Um, and, and here, you know, the picture we're showing here is where we put a pump at each heat pump. And by doing that, again, we can eliminate a strainer, we eliminate the pressure drop that goes with that, you get more efficient pumping, and, and it actually reduces first cost because you can eliminate shutoff valves, you can eliminate strainers, you can eliminate a lot of components that go with the, the, the PNT ports, all those things that go with you know, having separate you know, pumps remotely located to your heat pumps. Um, and then first cost, you know, you know, these things don't have to be more expensive, and I, I like to hit on that is that um, in residential they're almost always more expensive because residential systems have been optimized to be very inexpensive. We build a lot of really, the industry builds a lot of really expensive commercial HVC systems, right? So these things don't have to be more expensive than your traditional HVC systems. You know, th there may or may not be a premium for the geothermal system, and even if there is, we can usually make it pay back if we do the life cycle cost calcs, right? And design for low maintenance. You know, um, the keys for low maintenance are minimize air entrainment. Um, so we use like non-pressurized systems, or use a micro bubble air separator. So something that's really going to suck the air out of there uh, and keep the air out, so you don't have corrosion issues. Um, again, don't use steel if you can avoid it. Um, oversized expansion tanks. This is something unique that we do. Instead of putting a makeup water connection or a glycol fill station, we just oversize our expansion tanks. And if you calculate it right, you can precharge it with water a little higher than the air pressure, and actually fill the tank a little bit initially, so that if you have a little bit of leakage or a little bit of uh, you know pipe expansion or whatnot, it can actually you know inject a little bit of water into your geothermal system without having to have a makeup water system that um, might inter inject water and dilute your glycol. So there's some simple things that you can do with expansion tanks to reduce cost as well. Um, lower maintenance. You can, we really want to reduce or eliminate water treatment um, with piping choices by getting rid of steel if, as much as we can. And um, so you're going to use brass or stainless steel pumps. Uh, small systems, you can get um, plastic line expansion tanks. You can get brass air separators. On larger systems, again, you can use like domestic hot water store, uh, expansion tanks so that you don't have the steel components exposed to the water. You can do micro bubble air separators, which will really suck the air out of there. Um, which is really important because the, the HDP pipe that's used in the ground heat exchanger doesn't have an air barrier. So you're going to get air in that loop. I don't care how well you purged it. There's going to be oxygen in there. We really have, a way, have to have a way to take it out or, or you know, combat it with uh, you know, non-ferrous metals. And then built to last. And this is one of the most important points that I want people to take away from this presentation is that the typical warranty on the ground heat exchanger is 50 years. 50 years. And I've seen some with 60. But I've, every single manufacturer that makes pipe and puts it in the ground for these geothermal heat exchangers well, warranties the pipe for 50 years. That's the warranty. And they expect it to last probably double that, at least. And so and there's other components that, that you can design around that have much longer life. The whole point of this, though, is that these are very, very long life systems. And you really have to account for that when you do your life cycle cost analysis. You know, the DOE says that, that equipment should last longer, probably up to 25 years for inside components, and at least 50 years on the ground, he, ground heat exchanger loop. So you really have to account for that when you do your life cycle cost. You can't assume that that geothermal system is going to you know, be a big expense at the end of 20 years when you would normally replace uh, a lot of your other type of HVC equipment. And so for utility rates, the key is that you should, don't see near as much inflation on, uh, on electricity as you do natural gas. And I'll show that in a minute here. But the reason is really because of diversified production on the electric side that helps stabilize costs, and you're seeing renewable costs come way down as well. You put those two things together, and you see a lot less risk and a lot stabler bills over the year. You're going to have a much more stable bill over the year and over the life of the project, 
And really this chart kind of drives it home is like this is what EIA projects as inflation rates on electric and gas, you know, the red being the gas and the blue being the electric. The point being, if you're doing a life cycle cost analysis, the electric rates are not going to have as high of inflation as natural gas. That's just a fact. And that's been, that's been historically what's going on. That's likely to be what's the trend in the future. And it's because of that diversification thing, right? So if natural gas gets cheap, guess what? It's cheaper to make power because they're going to fire up those natural gas power plants. And, and electric's diversified, and it's always going to be cheaper. Um, and that trend's just going to continue to widen in the future. So you got to take that account in your life cycle cost. You know, the, the biggest thing is that 50-year warranty on that ground heat exchanger and the life of it being 100 years. So when you do that life cycle cost, you better be taking into account the, the residual value of that heat exchanger um, being you know, three-quarters of it there at the end of your 25-year life cycle cost because that is the number one most important thing that's missed is that you know, it, it might, that ground heat exchanger might cost you, say, $6 a square foot, on your building, but really, you know, the premium on that geothermal system might only be a dollar or two or three dollars a square foot because the equipment in the building actually costs less, less than a conventional system. The equipment's actually cheaper than it is in a conventional system. It's that ground heat exchanger you're paying the premium for it, but that ground heat exchanger is lasting for 100 years. So when you go to do that equipment replacement in 20, 25 years, whatever the number is, it's actually going to cost you less to put new equipment in your building at the end of that the life cycle of that equipment. And that ground heat exchanger is good for you know several more refreshes. So you really have to if you account for that and you and you value all that in your capital costs, these things can actually cost a lot less in capital cost. Forget the energy savings. They can be a lot cheaper systems in installation and replacement costs if you factor it in properly on the life of that ground heat exchanger. And of course, we talked about the fuel escalation rates and the longer life equipment, and and um, and if these things these things can be much lower maintenance costs than a traditional system, and typically that's reflected in the ASHRAE books in terms of uh, projected costs. And this is just one example I wanted to show quickly on um, if if you, even if you assume that the maintenance cost is the same and the equipment has the exact same lifespan, you can take a project like an, like we did here where you're talking about adding geothermal to a VRF system, so you're talking about water source VRF versus air source VRF, typically people would think that that's going to be an expensive proposition and it may not pay back. But the truth is that the equipment is so much cheaper when you go to replace it at year 20. In this chart you see that it starts out at, obviously it's a negative cost because it costs more to install up front, but you've made that back in energy before the equipment is replaced. And then on top of that, when you go to that, do that first equipment replacement, it's a big payday because that, ch that equipment is way cheaper. The water source units are way cheaper than the air source units. And the ground heat exchanger is good for probably the life of the building. So, it, you know, if you just look at the energy part of it, you're missing the big picture because that ground heat exchanger is so valuable. So to sum it up, you really, to really design an efficient system, you've got you've to design it to be efficient. You've got to right size it and make sure you're sizing it appropriately. Try to do everything you can to actually make the system smaller by using other energy efficiency measures. You're going to try to get rid of all those unnecessary components and actually make the system cheaper. If you design it for low maintenance, your maintenance guy is going to be much happier with you and you're going to have a very successful project. Uh, and, and if you do that life cycle cost calculation correctly, most times I think you're going to find that you can get a very, very cost effective system. So stop asking, you know, is geothermal economically feasible? And start asking, can we make it feasible on this project by combining it with other energy efficiency measures, by cutting out the waste and the things that aren't needed, and really get back to the basics of installing a really highly efficient system? Um, and really, how do you get, how do you translate into like getting an efficient geothermal system? You know, what does it take to get that? You know, if you're a project manager, if you're you know trying to hire engineers to do this. You, know, you want to hire smart engineers, and that's easier said than done, but you want to look for somebody that has experience with energy modeling, that has experience with high performance building design, and also ground heat exchanger design. You know, in my opinion, your engineer ought to be the guy doing all of those. You don't want to hire somebody that one guy to do the energy modeling and another guy that's doing the ground loop design as a sub. That's, you're not going to get a good result there. You want one guy that does all of that and can really optimize it all to work well together. You want to set clear goals, and this sounds obvious, but I've seen tons of system, efficient systems that were put in, you know, and they're paying $50, $60 a square foot for these geothermal systems, and that's ridiculous, you know. So set goals. It needs to be efficient.
but you also have to minimize first cost and make it low maintenance so that the maintenance guy can deal with it down the road. Um, emphasize integrated design. Um, harp on that because there's so much you can do to play that building like a piano and really optimize it and actually reduce the ground heat exchanger cost and, and make it cost effective. And then so some, some th services you want to procure, these just things to think about as like ad services that you wouldn't normally have on a building, energy modeling. You know, you really should take advantage of the fact that you have to do an energy model and use it to actually reduce the ground heat exchanger size by, by optimizing the building performance. Measure window performance. You know, that, that's sort of a unique thing we do. Um, it's, these meters are not expensive, like a thousand dollars a piece. You can go buy these window meters and they're, they're going to pay for themselves right off the bat. You know, it takes a little bit of effort to go use them and look up the windows, but you can really downsize your equipment um, in your ground loop just by getting an accurate size. And thermal conductivity testing, you know, where it's appropriate when you have a big enough building to justify it, do a conductivity test. It's going it, to, it's going to make a lot of sense. It, it really cuts out that safety factor that people are throwing on the, on the ground loop uh, just to make it work. So with that, I'd like to see if anybody has any questions that we can answer. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Matt. Um, this is Eric Mucklow again. I've opened up the Q&A box on the right-hand side of the screen. At the bottom of that white column, you'll see a text entry box. You can in type in your questions in there, and I will read them aloud uh, to our guest, and, uh, and so he can answer them, and they'll be captured on the recording, and I can uh, consolidate um, any, any redundancies. Uh, while people are test checking out uh, the text entry box and putting their stuff in, I'll point out a couple things. In the uh, web links um, box in the uh, middle of the screen to the right, we have a link to our past webinar videos. You can click on that and click brown twos and two, and it'll bring up our, our uh, hidden YouTube channel. I shouldn't say hidden, but uh, not searchable YouTube, YouTube channel that we uh, post our past webinars on. Uh, this one will be posted in, in a couple weeks. Um, we also have a link to the Mercy Energy Sustainability Energy site in which uh, where you can download your quizzes. And the uh, email address will appear there. Uh, it may or may not launch if you hit Browse 2, depending on how your system is configured. Um, again, if you... Um, let's see. If, in fact, there's somebody asking right now about the, uh, the AI credit website uh, to repost that. Um, if you follow that uh, link that says new sustainability and energy website, uh, click on that, click browse to, and that's where you can download your um, uh, quizzes, and then you can send the quizzes to that uh, email address. I'll go ahead and bring up that. There you go. For a little bit there. Um, <coughs> although now I've gotten rid of the text box, so let me go back to this format. Um, okay, anyway. So uh, another question is, what about foundation uh, the foundation of a building as a heat sink? Well, if you're going to have piles, like deep piles, that might be a good option for you. Um, if you can somehow incorporate uh, some sort of loop into those piles. Um, obviously, you've got to have a structural engineer that's on board with um, incorporating loops into the foundation. But if you talk about like shallow foundations, you got to be real careful because um, you're, you are changing the temperature of the ground locally to that to that footing or wherever you're trying to place that pipe. and you don't want that you know, heat transferring in or out of your building, so then you'd have to worry about insulation and that sort of thing. And, and you know, and these things influence the ground temperature within a certain radius of them, right? So we, we try to space them, you know, with vertical bores 20 feet apart. You know, more is better. They'll influence the ground temperature, you know, sometimes as much as 50 feet away, but it's sort of a gradient, right? Right close to it, it makes a big difference. Far away, it doesn't make a big difference. So, you know, if you try to if you try to do it, like, you know, it, it wouldn't be a great idea to put it right around your foundation walls and bury it right adjacent to your building because if you cause the soil to freeze around your building, you may end up with uh, you know pushing in walls and things like that. So the only application where I've seen that actually used is with like deep energy piles. You know, if you're going 100 or 200 or more feet, um, there's an opportunity there for sure. Okay. Uh, also, is there an effective way to measure the thermal energy produced from a ground source heat pump, or is it more estimated based on the load of the building size, et cetera? Uh, yeah, you certainly can measure it. Um, we actually did it on that uh, project at Camp Lincoln. Uh, it was one of the, it was a grant through the Department of Energy for that project, and one of the stipulations was where they measure the energies, right? So it's easy to measure the power going to the heat pump, right? You just put a power meter on the, the power going to it. But so how much thermal energy is it producing? Well, if you measure the flow rate and you measure the temperature difference on the on the ground source side, on the water side of it, 
you can measure how much thermal energy is putting out. And if you take the difference between the electrical energy into the heat pump and that thermal energy, you can figure out, you know, how much, you know, what your COPs are and that sort of thing. So y you can measure them. It's not cheap. It's not cheap to do, but it can be done. Uh, in regards to that energy, is that uh, is that something that LEED considers as a renewable energy source or, or no? The, the, I don't believe that LEED does. I've never actually had that question. The federal government recognizes it as a renewable energy source. Um, some states have started recognizing it as that. But it, it can count towards your federal goals. I do not believe it will count towards the LEED renewable energy credits. It would just go towards the efficiency of the building. And I think some of our mandates, uh, like ESA 2007, is versus an, is different from EPACT 05. Uh, one counts only electricity de generated, and the other one does count thermal energy, uh, such as geothermal and transpired yeah, it, it, uh, it depends which law and which which regulation. But yeah, the the 25 percent goal, I believe you can count the thermal energy towards, but the um, the 15 percent target has to be renewable electricity. So it depends on which rule you're looking at. Right. Yes, uh, and somebody else responded that they that, that was their opinion as well is that lead doesn't count as renewable energy just as an efficiency measure. Um, okay, well we are a bit uh, beyond the hour, um, and so I think uh, we can wrap it up there. Uh, thanks, Matt, for joining us. Uh, apologies, everyone, for technical difficulties in getting going. Uh, I'll see if I can cut some of that <laughs> out of our uh, uh, video uh, when we upload it. Load it, but. Um, if you have any more questions or if you want to get on the mailing list for future uh, webinars, the, uh, in the text box at the top of the screen is the email address s underscore e webinar at usace.army.mil. That's also the same address that you send your quizzes to. Um, and your quizzes, again, you can download them from this, the uh, Sustainability Energy website and the Mercy site. Uh, also down there at the, uh, in the box at the bottom uh, right is a, uh, is a copy of the presentation. I'll leave this window up a little bit so people can click on that and say save to the computer and they can download these slides and then you'll have uh, Mr. Slager's contact information which is on the last slide there as well. Uh, so with that, um, thank you uh, Mr. Slager and uh, everyone else who's joined us and thank you Hope for, uh, for helping us uh, with the intro to the RESCX as we, uh, as we got started. Uh, thank you all very much. Thank you all and thank you Matt. Thank you everybody.